Hello guys, I'm back. I'm just going to conclude this book. And God, thank God. <laughs> it feels like a marathon. I can see the finishing line now. It's just like, oh, oh. Because it's, it's been a hard book to read, I've got to admit, guys. I'm quit. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was a good reader um, until you read something like this. And when you've got all these Greek words, these old Greek words, uh, Herodotus and all these crazy Greek words, and you've got the Middle Eastern names, the, the old Assyrian names, and um, the Gaelic, the the Roman Leviticus, Maximus, all the, all these um, all these different words that I've never seen before. I've never said them in my life. They've never came out this mouth. Um, but it's it's been interesting. It's been a learning curve. I've learned lots reading it. Don't necessarily agree with all of it, but it's kind of. It's kind of along the lines of what I was thinking for a while. I've been thinking for quite a few years now that there was a link between Israel and Scotland. There's a link between the Hebrews and the Celts. I've just been seeing little little signs, even in the, the language, the culture, uh, the royal lineages think they're derived from King David. and It's all these little clues that point. And, and in a way, this guy's wrapping it all up and... And at the end of this book, he's kind of saying that Jerusalem in the Bible is actually Edinburgh. A lot of these places in the Bible, he says Palestine, was, he says it's meant to have all these uh, minerals and rivers and mountains in the, in the Bible and it's hard to nail them down in Palestine because it's, it's a wasteland. It's a total wasteland. There's nothing there. And it's, you hardly grow anything. And when you compare it to Edinburgh, the lush green, um, covered in volcanic hills, but he's, we're going to have a look at the comparisons, what he compares. We've got Edinburgh here and we've got Jerusalem. We've got Jerusalem on the left, Edinburgh on the right. And we'll see how it compares. But there's nine pages left, guys, so this will be the final conclusion to the book. And like I said, it's been a, it's been a long trek. And thanks for everybody that's actually joined and listened to this series. Because I was, I was beginning to listen to a YouTuber who started this book. And he gave in by the fifth or sixth video, about halfway through the book be less than halfway and it was a bit of disappointment because I was enjoying it so I'm glad I've done this and for other people to enjoy and for me to listen back on for my own research because I'll continue the research after this book but it's been good guys it's been good and thanks again like I said for joining me um, because it has been a hard a hard run but we see the finishing line now so it's all good right where were we in the book? Here. Having given the description of the real Jerusalem, I will now proceed to identify the principal landmarks of it with those of Edinburgh. The identification between the two will be seen to be remarkable in every way, comparable if is possible, in view of changes in the ages. So in Jerusalem, you have... David's city or Zion or the citadel in Edinburgh, we've got the Edinburgh Castle. We've got the Milo or the Milo and in Edinburgh the Castle Mott. Jerusalem, Mount Ophel and Upper City. Edinburgh you've got the Esplanade and Castle Hill. Jerusalem you've got Upper Market Place. In Edinburgh you've got Lawn Market. Jerusalem, the Tyropoan Valley, Edinburgh. The George V Bridge. Jerusalem, the Temple, Mount, Moriah, Edinburgh, St Giles Cathedral and Law Courts. In Jerusalem, the High Street of God. We've got the High Street. We've got Lower Market Place and East Street, the Cannon Gate. Third Hill over against Accra. Edinburgh has the south back of Cannon Gate and Cowgate. Bazitha, New City, Colton Hill and North Back of Canongate, the Pool of Bethesda, Norlock, now Princess Street Station and Beyond West, which is now Princess Street Gardens as well. There used to be a giant lock in front of the castle and it turned into a midden. They called it a midden. Uh, where they, they used to pour all their, their muck and their dirt in it. They filled it up. They filled it up. Anyway. The Valley of Jehoshaphat, Princess Street Gardens westwards. The Pool of Siloam, South Lock or Old Borough Lock, now drained. 
This is the one I was talking about, it was drained. Fountain Gate, Bristolport, King's Garden Gate in Jerusalem, and you've got King's Bridge, foot of the castle. The gates of Essenes, Canning Gate in Edinburgh. Dungate in Jerusalem, compare it to the King's Stables Gate or Dung Port. The Valley Gate, the West Port, the Water Gate, and in Edinburgh we've got the Water Gate, East End of City, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, Arthur's Seat, King Arthur's Seat, Solomon's Palace of Lebanon, Holyrood House on site of the gardens and gardens, Joppa the Port, Joppa, Port of Edinburgh, Valley of Hinnom, uh, Castorfin Road, Mount Tophet, Place of Burning, Castorfin Hill, and Castorfin Hill, that's the biggest hill in Edinburgh, and within the city, <clears throat> the hills that you see me on, the Pentland Hills, they're higher, but they're, they kind of share a few districts, they share um, like Edinburgh, Pennycook, they cover a, quite a, a large area, Golgotha, Place of Skulls, Gogar's Mount and District, Hinnom and Falkirk, and Falkirk's not Edinburgh, it's actually over the water. Certain of these sites may be examined in more detail with advantage. City of David. Joab skilled the rock with the Jezebits, considered impregnable. And that's that's funny, the Jebusites. The Jebusites. Um, that reminds me of the Jacobites. The Jacobites. In 1312, Randolph scaled Edinburgh Castle Rock and captured it from the English. D David dwelt in the fort and called it the City of David, and David built round about the Milo onwards. Milo, long a puzzle to Bible students, is explained by the moat at Edinburgh Castle, which projects the fortress from attack from the Esplanade. David erected a house or place of cedar in the fort, and here he lived and died, at leaving Hebron. The fortress commanded Ophel and had the strong tower that jutteth out with its entrance by a barbican over Milo leading to a gallery or passage. In Edinburgh, the famous Half Moon Battery juts out and commands the approach to the Castle Rock and reconstructed in 1574 and constitutes a formidable defence. The ancient strength of the fortress is shown by the fact that af after Titus stormed to the powerful fortress Antonia guarding the temple, he had yet to face great difficulties to capture the upper city. There was a secret exit from the citadel which led to the king's garden gate and towards the fountain gate, the way Zedekiah took when he tried to escape from Nebuchadnezzar. In Edinburgh we have the king's bridge leading to Bristow Port, equivalent of the fountain gate. Josephus speaks of a long underground passage leading from the city of David to the temple, extended onwards to the king's palace, Solomon's, near the Mount of Olives. In Edinburgh, there is re reputedly in the castle below the Argyle Battery the termination of a secret staircase now blocked up, supposed to lead to St Giles Cathedral and to Holyrood House beyond. Ooh, I might look into that one a wee bit more deeper. We find in Nehemiah that the Fountain Gate was repaired by Shalom, the wall of the Pool of Silo, Silom, near the King's Garden, and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, repaired over against the sepulchres of David and to the pool that was made and unto the house of the mighty. Also we find they buried Hezekiah in the ascent of the sepulchres of the sons of David, meaning that they buried him in the sepulchres where David's bones lay, namely in vaults under the fortress. The pool was one constructed poorly by the he Hezekiah. <coughs> Inside the fortress, the house of the mighty, was the house of the elders or senate transferred to Edinburgh Castle. Nehemiah refers to the repair of the castle walls along the south side, where is the old parliament house near the palace, and to the parts opposite the tombs near the old parliament house. The castle, indeed, can present to this day no different front to that of 415 BC, the supposed de date of Nehemiah's visit, although far earlier in reality, its being a static site with a definite strong points. A modder's visitors crossing the outer port and portcullis to the castle passes the guardhouse, climbs the rock-bound passage with the state prison on the right, and reaches the Argyle Battery, commanding the height to the north. Beyond is the governor's house and the garrison's barrack nearby. Mounting higher, he attains the Half Moon Battery, overlooking the Esplanade and Castle Hill, where 
the old barracks for the king's bodyguard. Then comes the palace or royal lodging with the old palace yard and the old parliament house below which exists a double series of stone vaulted chambers of immense age, leading possibly to the former tombs of the kings of Judah. In short, Edinburgh Castle is in all features absolutely identical with the city of David. Nothing lacks conformity and the castle faces east as most certainly did the Jewish citadel overlooking Ophel, the temple and the Mount of Olives beyond. Ophel, Nehemiah repaired Ophel where dwelt the high priest Elishib, Elijah and other ecclesiastical dignitaries. Dr. Royal, late Dean of Westminster, in the comments in the book of Nehemiah, says it lay immediately south of the temple precincts. This is wrong. It lay immediately west of them and was se severed from the temple by the Tyropian Valley, but at one time a bridge across the ravine connected the two. The wall round Ophel was enlarged and re repaired by Palau from the turning of the wall to the tower th that lay th out the king's house by the court of the prison. Here is another allusion of the half-moon battery facing the present esplanade, the tower which layeth out. Tyropoan Valley. Perhaps more than any other typographical feature, this identifies Edinburgh with Jerusalem. A narrow chasm or ravine which ran from north to south, crossed from the valley of Jehoshaphat in the north of the city towards Siloam in the south, thus cutting the otherwise continuous hill from the citadel to the Watergate in two, on the west of the Tyropean Valley was the upper market place in Ophel, on its east the mount or hill of Moriah, and said to have be the adjoining the latter, stood the great tower of Antonia, built by Herod to defend the temple, which was stormed by Titus and later thrown down and utterly destroyed by order of Hadrian, stone by stone. This Antonia was erected on the site of the former tower of Hananel, both built in the same purpose, namely for the defence of the adjoining temple. In Nehemiah's day, El Eliashib and other priests restored the city wall and a portion of the great fortress, Hananel, which commanded the temple then. The Tyropoan Valley was partly filled in during the rule of the Maccabees, Maccabe, the intention pro being probably to unite the upper and lower city, but was not completed. And this is another thing that got me thinking, people, this whole, the rising of these Jewish Maccabees. And Maccabees, this is this, this word... If I, never, if I never heard it in Jewish um, history, and if I just seen this word without hearing it in the Jew, I just think this is out, an outright Scottish word, a really Scottish word, more Scottish than English. <clears throat> a bridge spanned the gap, and in the struggle between Arist Aristobulus and Hyrcaninus, the former cut the connection between the temple and the upper city by breaking down the bridge that joined them together. We have in Edinburgh the exact replica in the valley or ravine between Castle Hill and the High Street. There is now the humpbacked hill called George V Bridge, evidently of artificial construction. In fact, the road called George V Bridge was only partially raised in the reign of that king and proceeds from the south where was formerly the borough or south lock going north and south like the Tyropian Valley and like it formerly a ravine. Evidence of its comparative lateness is shown of what remains of West Bow. Once upon a time, the only means of approach to the castle via Johnston Terrace, an access very steep and widening, reaching the summit where Castle Hill and the Lawn Market can join. George V Bridge proceeds northward downhill and in the valley beyond passes the mound on its east. The mound is of considerable interest, for until a couple of centuries ago, it lay a huge mass of rubbish of undeterminate origin, though various reasons were advanced on the subject. It had lain there longer than the oldest inhabitant could remember and was called Geordie's Boyd Mudbrig, although who was the said Geordie Boyd and how he accumulated the huge mass of stone and rubbish, no one knew. It came to be used as a city dump and it was probably drawn upon heavily from the making of the George V Bridge and likewise provided the foundations for those two fine edifices, the Scottish Royal Academy and the National Gall Gallery erected on the site. When all the foregoing is taken into consideration, this vast mass of debris can only have been the ruins of the Tower Antonia, for the mound occupied the same position as the correspondent Antonia did in Jerusalem. An ancient and unaccountable mound of stone, all broken debris found exactly on the corresponding site to Antonia, gives one, profound, one profoundly to think. There can be little doubt that the resemblance between George V Bridge 
In the Tyropian Valley, both ravines, both cutting through the most important hill, is so remarkable that it could not be duplicated by similar topographical surroundings in any other city in the world. The Pool of Siloam. Josephus tells us that the Ty Tyropian Valley southwards extended to the Pool of Siloam had sweet drinking waters in great plenty and lay against the old city wall which skirted it. Nehemiah describes how he rode to the valley gate before the dragon well, then to Dung Gate near the king's stables where he viewed the broken walls, then to the fountain gate and to the king's pool or sol Siloam. The king's garden lay in the vicinity for he mentions those who repaired the dung and fountain gates and the wall of the pool of Siloam and the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. All these references from the valley gate to Siloam covered the western end of the city and a part of the southwest. The valley gate was that which led from the western extremity of the walls to the valley of Hinnom, and old Edinburgh answering to West Port leading to Kudstorfen Road. Dung gate answers to Dung Port, a gate near King's Stables at the foot of Edinburgh Castle at the west, the place where Scottish kings held their jousts. A little more southerly is Fountain Bridge, leading to the grass market below the castle walls, which recalls the old name, although the Fountain Gate of Jerusalem must be identified with Bristow Port. The southern extremity of the former ravine, now George V Bridge, is known as Bristow Port, which abutted an old borough lock, once a considerable freshwater lake, corresponding with the Pool of Siloam, a road called the Venel, formerly a lane which followed the line of the city wall, points to the situation of Bristol Port in the former lock. Westport, the valley gate of Jerusalem, stands at the head of the Venel and its continuation finds Port Hopetown, terminus of the Union Canal, as the probable last remains of the former old borough or south lock, which at one time stretched over most of Heriot's school. <coughs> the Royal Infirmary, George Square and the Meadows, reaching eastward as far as the Cowgate, the actual position of the Cowgate itself is lost, but it was probably connected with the temple on whose site is St Giles Cathedral. It may have been the gate, Mipcad, through which the bullock of sacrifice was led to the altar. Ezekiel, it would explain the name cow. In, 19, in 1693, Slezer in his work Theatrium Scotti says that Edinburgh's borough lock extended to the Cowgate and the iron rings were still to be seen fixed to the walls of houses where people tied up their boats. The situation of this former lock and low-lying land, fed in part by underground streams that flow yet from Arthur's seat through the back of Cannon Gate and Cowgate and allied possibly with the water of Leaf, agrees with the position of the Pool of Siloam. A temple. Herod's fine temple incurred severe, severe priestly criticism because he placed a golden eagle over the entrance and the priests accepted no other symbol of divinity than fire. On the site of Solomon, and later Zerubbabel's temples, it stood of the crown of the hill as Moriah or Mount Moriah, with the powerful tower of Antonio abutin on it to its northwest, which fortress had its foundations partly built up by artificial material from the base of the hill and was described as a high square edifice with round towers at each corner like so many Scottish baronial castles. The Romans, as before mentioned, destroyed every vestige of Herod's temple, as also of the Antonia, whose broken stones may have been formed, the mast of debris which became known as Geordie Boyd's mud brig at St Giles Cathedral, and the present law courts must occupy the former site of Herod's temple raised to the ground. The High The High or the High Street of God led upwards to the temple from the lower marketplace and agrees topographically with Edinburgh High Street and Cannon Gate, the latter an ecclesiastical borough with a religious distinction all its own. Apart from the cathedral, Sir Walter Scott urged the claims of Cannon Gate within those Ballywick stands Hollywood House, its traditional founder being St David and St John Street. Entering the Cannon Gate by an archway stands the Kilwinning Lodge of Freemasons, said to be one of the oldest, if not the actual oldest, Masonic Lodge in the world, a craft traditionally funded, founded by Solomon, but undoubtedly on its or origin to yet earlier period although Solomon was certainly a master craftsman. Kilwinning's Masonic Temple, dedicated to St John, recalls that he was an Essien, a most important sect in Jerusalem which possessed a house or lodge near the gate of the Essien, so-called, after them. In Edinburgh, 
by the back of Canon Gate was the Canon Gate, and it would correspond with that of Essens. Bezitha. The great increase of population led to the development of the fourth hill across the valley of Jesaphat, which lay on the ground north of the temple in the tower Antonia. The valley of Jesaphat, now occupied by the railway station in Princess Street, with formerly the Norlock skirting the north walls of the castle, orig originally the pool of Beth Bethesda, enables us to identify Bezitha with Edinburgh's north back of a cannon gate in Colton Hill and the modern Princess Street, Joppa. It is astonishing at first thought that the identical name of the port of Joppa was borne by both Jerusalem and Edinburgh, but it should be remembered that the name and position of Jerusalem were destroyed and proscribed by Foru Majeur, and it would be easy to overlook the name of the port, even though it lies only three miles distant from the Hadrian's doomed city. Josephus says Joppa that it was not naturally a haven, for it ends in a rough and straight shore, as applies to the Edinburgh Joppa, now largely embraced in Portobello. That's interesting as well, that the, 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 the two... The two ports Joppa and and you hear the there's this this new sort of Christianity group and you've got flat earth people like Ronnie and Jason awake souls um, who are calling Jesus or God Yawashaway or Yagushaway or names like this because they said that Jays never existed Jays never existed well what if they existed in Britain maybe that's why Jays did exist. Maybe these guys are getting it wrong that the fact that oh it couldn't have, it couldn't have started in Israel because there wasn't Jays. Well, that's because it never started in Israel. What if it started in Britain? And Jays were used. There were dangerous rocks off the shore, and the north wind beats upon the shore. He continues and dashed mighty wave against the rocks. When this black north wind blew a gale, it dashed ships against one another and carried some of them out to sea. Joppa in the North Sea does suffer from northeasterly gales, but a nor'easter in the eastern Mediterranean would blow off the land. At our British Joppa, the mighty seas and stormy weather beat against the rocks and numerous skerries in that open sea. With Joppa where it is now identified, we have a rational explanation of how Josephus claimed that traditionally Andromeda was bound to a rock near Joppa, intended to be devoured by a sea monster when Perseus rescued her, a story cast in the Atlantic region. Its position also explains the Tyrian fishermen were said to be able to sell their catch in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, for when they were fishing in the North Sea, they had no distance to go, no long journey over hills for 35 miles. Incidentally, from Edinburgh from early time, there were a paved road to Joppa called the Fishwives' Causeway, because the women used to walk to the port to purchase the fish as landed. The Mount of Olives This famous height which dominates Jerusalem is represented in the Near East by a long flat hill, which only exceeds the height of the Mosque of Omar by 180 feet. The Mount of Olives, as its name betokens, was originally planted with olive groves, myrtles and oaks, and on a flank of it lay the King's Gardens, belonging to the former House of Lebanon, of Solomon, and later called the Garden of Geth Gethsemane, where Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ. If you look to Arthur's seat in the King's Park as the true site of this renowned height, and whose summit towers 822 feet above the city below, there may even be found the explanation of the disaster reported by Zechariah when the great earthquake split a part of the mount in two, leaving a valley between. Near Salisbury Crags, below Arthur's seat, there is a tremendous physical feature, together with Samson's rib, the rib of Hercules, where the bare basalt columns resemble a giant's ribs dipped downwards to the lower road, leaving a valley between. Now a roadway, this remarkable geological fault or fracture is the effect of a seismic visitation and well explains Zachariah's statement. Arthur's seat dominates Edinburgh, as the Mount of Olives did to Jerusalem. From the east, its lower heights, ringed with former terraces or lynchets, point to the time when the olive and vines were planted there. I'll let you have a wee look at Arthur's seat, guys. Um, interesting. I've been up this place many times. This is where I made my living on a volcano video on Arthur's seat because it's, it's ex-volcanic -volca 
this is Arthur's seat here, guys. And I think it was, who, oh, I'm trying to remember his name. Let's see. Samson's ribs. I know that I know the the part of the Arthur seat is talking about. So I've been there. Anyway. Arthur's seat dom dominates Edinburgh as the Mount of Olive is the Jerusalem. From the east at Lower's Heights, ringed with former terraces or lynchets point to the time where olive and vines were planted there. Buried in the soil of Arthur's seat, bronze swords and celts have been found and proved the eminence and great antiquity of the site. Sir Daniel Wilson, in his prehistoric annals of Scotland, reports that on the eastern slopes was found a coin bearing the effigy of a man wearing a turban and with an inscription in Hebrew bearing the name Solomon ben Isaac. Probably carefully, archaeological research might unearth others. Solomon's Palace after completing the temple, Solomon erected his own house or palace near the Mount of Olives. It was only a residence, but also the seat of administration and a court for the hearing of causes and pleas. It had two quadrangular wings joined to a central hall and a portico, a chapel with a massive pillars and a court of prodigi prodigious size, wherein the king, seated on a throne of ivory, delivered judgment, called the House of the Forest of Lemuron, Probably because it was mainly built of oaks and cedars of Lebanon. It was Solomon's own house. The Jewish Targum places it near the city. And this is the thing, this is another thing, guys. Called the house of the so King Solomon was built this house was uh, the house of the forest. And it was Lebanon and this this tree, this Lebanon Cedar, Lebanon cedar, isn't from Lebanon by the way. That's my daughter in the background. <laughs> uh. Cedar near to the middle, all right, eastern Mediterranean basin. It is an evergreen conifer. It can reach 40 meters in height. Let's see. Well, there you go. It is. It's from. It is from Lebanon. Let's see. Conservation of the Cedrus Labani populations, Lebanon. Cedrus Labani, the cedars of Lebanon, is a threatened conifer native to the Levant. Over 4,000 years of exploitation, it resulted 
and the fragmentation and degradation of the Lebanese cedar population. Continued urban and agricultural development in Lebanon as to the difficulty of effective conserv conservation. Two protected areas have recently been established which contain two of the more important forests, a cedar-dominated forest in the Shuf region and a mixed forest at Edin. A number of the populations are protected by ministerial decrees. I thought the Lebanon cedar was a, was a European tree, even though it had the name Lebanon, but I could be wrong. I'll research that later. Oaks and cedars of Lebanon. It was Solomon's own house. The Jewish Targum places it near the city. The gardens of this place lay alongside the Mount of Olives and were watered by the brooks of Kedron. Nothing in the environs of Jerusalem can answer to this palace or its gardens, but Holyrood House is situated exactly where it meets the description of Solomon's house. From time immemorial, here was a royal domain, St. David, Edinburgh's patron saint, as in most fitting, was reputed to have built an abbey on the site of the later Holyrood House, which he dedicated to the Holyrood because of a miracle related to a huge stag near Arthur's seat, whereby the stag charged him by some extraordinary means a fragment of the Holyrood was placed in his hands and the beast turned and fled. Hinnon and Gologa, Gol, Golgotha, the name, the valley of Hinnom, west of Jerusalem, had an evil reputation, for here stood the high place, a Havite altar, where Solomon had erected reeking altars to the deities Astarte, Chemosh, and Mil Milcom. Josiah, when reproached, had them thrown down and defiled, and he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of Hinnom, that no man make his son or daughter to pass through the fire of Moloch. Hereabouts were buried the corpses of the vast army that was besieging Jerusalem at the moment when the Almighty from on high destroyed them by a mighty blast. It was first called the Valleys of Slaughter, and appropriately so. The days come that this place shall no more be called Tophet, or the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, but the Valleys of Slaughter. I have described the shambles previously with the graphic description of Ezekiel, of the stench occasioned by the bodies in the Valley of Rephaim, or giants, and he adds, Shall, it, shall call it the valley of multitude of Gog. Here it might be added was appropriately the Jewish show or hell region and why the lands outside Edinburgh area, including Lanark, were named Damnia and Damnai or the Damned. This valley of Hamon Gog, valley of slaughter, valley of Rephaim, subsequently given the name of Gol Golgotha, the place of Gothic skulls. Goths, the invaders beloved of Moses or Zalmoxus, on whom he intended to bestow the lands of Judah, were regarded as Goths in the age which buried their thousands, and Golgotha it became for good and all, the place where the skulls and bones of these grim reminders of our dramatic and terrible past were, were often dug up in later times and reburied. The main road from Edinburgh to Falkirk, Hinnom, reaches Castorfin Hill, about two miles out of the cap capital of Scotland. On one's right, now the middle of a golf course, originally there is little doubt, Tophet, the place of sacrifice, another two miles along the Falkirk Road, and we reach Gogar, Gogar Mount, Gogar Village, Gogar Burn, and other landmarks bearing the name Gogar. The antiquity of the name is supported by the fact that the Ro Romans called it Gugernum, a mere Latinized version of Gogar, and they maintained a cohort of troops here. It is important to our world of today if Christ and his example and his willing sacrifice to die for a better world is of interest to a modern world as many begin to doubt. Here is the original Golgotha where he was crucified. To this spot four miles from Edinburgh did he bear the cross on which they nailed him. Hinnom. The original name Hinnom, Valley of Hinnom, which occurs in the scriptures implies that there was a town of that name. It is known today as Falkirk. The Aitar Atonas terms the fifth fort on or town going along the Anton Wall from the Firth of Forth to the Clyde Estuary by the name Hunnam, differing from Hinnom in only the vowels letters. Ravenous, less reliable, terms it Ono. Gildas mentioned it in connection with Seer Eden, Edinburgh, and says the Picts called it Pen Fal, head of the river Fal. It was the most important military post for Camelodunum or Cam Camelon Bay adjoining and from its ancient docks discovered by General 
general royal ships carried cargoes to and from the Forth. As well as transacting a large transport trade to the Clyde, many fragments of Simeon and Roman ware have been found on the site of this great fortress. One further point may be mentioned when the intractable Jews in 134 proclaimed their Messiah in Bar Kokheba, son of the star, and the chief rabbi, Akiba, publicly anointed him king of the Jews, placed a crown on his head, and then, as his master of horse, <coughs> Followed him into the field at the head of 24,000 horsemen, we may applaud their reckless courage and we should recognise it, in fact, a Salarian rising against the Roman tyranny. Coins were minted bearing Bar Kokiba's name, inscribed First Year of Redemption, and on reverse they bore the insignia of the Scottish thistle. When Hadrian destroyed Jerusalem, he forbade the use of the name and the new city which arose was called Elia. The fortress of the north boundary of Edinburgh near Abercorn, now Canale, was formerly named Pont Elia. Antonin later, the Ilium or Elia of which it was a boundary bridge could only relate to Edinburgh. These are stern facts to ignore. And that's the end, guys. Wow. It ended with um, the author stating that the real Jerusalem is actually Edinburgh. And it does make a lot of good um, parallels. And so like I said, guys, um, there's a reason why I, I got drawn to this book, because I was al already interested. I could already see lots of clues that connect Jewish Bible history, Celtic, with Celtic history. Um, people think that there, there's there's certain movements that think that the the tribes of the Exodus uh, spread to Europe. There's these Brit Brit Am movements that say that after the Exodus the tribes split up and went through Europe and then they became the European royal families. But I think it's the other way around, guys. I think the Celts were the Hebrews, were the tribes uh, that spread throughout Europe. Probably as Rome backed. Back to back in Italy when they left Britain, um, and like I said, when I look at lots of art, when you go up to the museum and look at all the Scottish artifacts, and there's so much connecting Scotland with the the Holy Land for some reason. I, I I never understood why. I never understood why there's this connection with Scotland and the Holy Land. Um, and when you look at the royal family. You look at the, the Queen, how she, she thinks she's descended from King David. It all starts to make sense. It all starts to make sense. And it seems far-fetched to think the Queen thinks... She, our Queen of Great Britain thinks she's descended from someone away in, a way, way, way in the Middle East. When really, what if the person she descended from never left Great Britain? What if they actually are from these isles? Which is crazy, guys. It is crazy. And these are all the, the works consulted during the making of his book. Really good, really good stuff, guys. <coughs> I hear my daughter going crazy, I don't know if you can hear. Uh, my missus, she's getting her ready for her bath. So she's going to be a bit crazy. So I think I might just cut this short, but it was a really good book and I'm, I'm glad I finished it. I'm glad I finished it because it was hard work. Like I said, it felt like running a marathon. I could just see the finishing line there, but really interesting stuff. And it's, it's this will definitely make me look at certain places in Edinburgh with a different outlook. Um, like I said, I think the author has put a lot of good good evidence, presented a lot of good evidence to support his theories. I think the the black magic stuff, because I think he, he reckons the black magic was a form of gunpowder, but the black magic could be like um, when you've seen the old mages, the old Celtic mages, and they sprinkle stuff in the, the fire and they create like, like a wee explosion. Maybe that was the, maybe the black magic was what the mages had, this black stuff to create the poof. See the poof in the flames. Anyway, guys, I'm rambling, but thanks for joining me. And I'm 
and I hope you enjoyed these series of books. If anyone's got any suggestions for any anything relating to this in any way, any books, PDFs, um, leave a comment and I might consider reading it, depending on how long it is. This was a long book, this one. Anyway, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. And the next time you hear me, I'll probably be moaning about Flat Earth. Okay, people? Take care.